Okay, uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Jacinta Cording. I'm a, um, that's really loud. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I am a lecturer at the University of uh, Canterbury. So I lecture in forensic psychology at the um, School of Psychology, Speech and Hearing. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about common misconceptions about crime. So forensic psychology, uh, it's mainly to do with the rehabilitation of offenders, um, so a little bit about the causes of crime, what makes people um, behave in the way they do when it's antisocial, and then a little bit around like eyewitness testimony, how do we um, extract accurate information during interrogations, that sort of thing. Uh, crime is an area where people can get very emotive. Everyone's had experience of crime, unfortunately, and that means that it's really rife for uh, I guess pseudoscience for people to not apply rationality and facts when it comes to trying to combat crime. So uh, that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about today. Um, in particular, there are three areas that people often ask uh, me about, so I thought people might find it interesting. Uh, first of those is criminal profiling. So what is criminal profiling and does it actually work? Uh, second of all, how do we predict who is going to go on to reoffend? Who are the dangerous people that we might need to look at um, giving treatment or alternatively keeping in prison, which is now an option in New Zealand? And then finally, psychopathy. What is a psychopath and can psychopaths be treated? So, first of those, criminal profiling. So I'm going to start, sorry, it's a little bit blurry, but I'm going to start in 1940 in New York. So there was a series of bombs that were planted in the city over the course of about 17 years. So they originally were targeted a power company called Con Edison, um, and then progressively they started um, being placed in telephone booths, in movie theatres, in libraries, in places where people congregated. Um, so in total, 33 bombs were planted over 17 years, 22 um, successfully detonate, detonated and injured 15 people. So police were having a really tough time trying to identify who this person was and stopping them. Um, sometimes the bombs would be accom accompanied by notes. So the notes were actually handwritten, um, but for some reason it's all dramatised and all I could find online was ones that made it look like they were cut out of magazines. It's not actually what they looked like. But they would say things like, I will make the Con Edison sorry. I will bring them before the bar of justice, of public, op uh, pub public opinion will condemn them for beware, I will place more under theatre seats in the near future. Spoke about the dastardly deeds of, um, I don't think it's on there, but there's some that talk about the dastardly deeds that people need to pay for at Con, Con Edison, that sort of thing. So police just couldn't identify this person. And so what they did is they brought in this person. This is James Brussels. So he was a psychiatrist during the Korean War. And they, they asked him, is there any way that you might be able to tell us who this guy is, if it is a guy, um, on the basis of these notes and of, of the behaviours of planting these bombs in all these different places? Up until that point, this hadn't happened before. But James Brussel came up with what he called reverse psychology. And he used that to come up with a probable profile of this mad bomber. And this is what it looks like. So, foreign-born of uh, a foreign-born male of Eastern European descent. So that came from um, the style of the handwriting, as well as the fact that they used kind of strange language like dastardly deeds. That's where that came from. Uh, I'll go to the next to this one. Suffers from paranoia. Probably a pretty good guess, right? Based on those notes, based on what they were doing, um, seemed to have a uh, hatred of authority. Felt that they were being persecuted by people. Seemed to fit the idea of someone who has paranoia. On the basis of this, he knew from research that people typically tend to show symptoms of paranoia about age 30. So the fact it was 15 years later when he was brought into the investigation, he assumed that this person would now be between 40 and 50 years of age. That's where that came from. Um, clean shaven, neatly dressed, um, that came from the handwriting was incredibly neat, no errors, no um, cross outs or anything. Athletic build, again, um, they'd been doing a lot of research looking at the body types for people with different kinds of mental illness. People with paranoia tended to be people with athletic builds. 
Now, single living with female relatives, that's where we, uh, good old Freud made an appearance. So the idea was that this guy had an erotic uh, fixation, fixation on his mother, hated his father, and then that then transferred into a hatred for authority, a hatred for the people at Con Edison. So lived with female relatives because they reminded him of his mum. Um, and also some weird stuff about inserting bombs in seats, and yeah, I'll leave it there, but that was part of it too. This one, so wears a double-breasted suit with the buttons done up. I think he was just showing off with that one. I don't know where he, quite where he got that. So uh, the police took this profile, didn't actually help them find anyone. So they did eventually manage to find the guy, which I just gave you a sneak peek of, George Metzke. So they found him by going through employee records from Con Edison and finding people who might have a grievance against the company. So he had um, been injured in an accident at Con Edison and had um, developed tuberculosis and had been fired because of health complications afterwards. Um, so that is how they found him. They went to his house uh, late at night in order to arrest him. Uh, they found that he was a athletic, a thick-set person, um, Lithuanian descent. Um, oh, I didn't mention before, they, he had hypothesized that he would be Eastern European um, from the Slavic region because of the um, history of anachronism and planting bombs in there. So this guy was from Lithuania. Um, he had a history of paranoia, petty disputes with neighbors, um, uh, feelings of persecution with multiple people in his life. Lived with his two sisters, um, had never been married. He was uh, described as being fastidious, is the language that they used, and apparently his bedroom was creepily neat. Um, unfortunately, they arrested him at night, so he was wearing his pyjamas when they came to arrest him. But the story goes that before he was taken away, he asked if he could get changed, and he came out of his bedroom wearing a double-breasted suit with the buttons done up, apparently. So... Although the, the profile didn't actually help the police locate this guy, the fact that it was similar afterwards led to this idea that maybe there is something in this. Maybe there is a way that we can link the crimes that people uh, commit to what their personality is or who they are as a person. So this led to a series of um, or a, a research project that's now immortalized in Mindhunter, if any of you guys have Netflix. Uh, where the FBI went around interviewing uh, serial sexual homicide offenders, um, 36 of them in the 1970s, including uh, people like uh, Ed Kemper, John Wayne Gacy, Son of Sam, they interviewed uh, Charles Manson, people like that. And what they did on the basis of that is come up with a profile type that these people seem to fit into on the basis of their crimes and what they said was the motivations behind them. So FBI profiling uh, relies on distinction between modus operandi and criminal signature. So basically modus operandi is how did the person commit their offense? So they're all acts that kind of contribute to the, the final crime that's being committed. This will typically change as offenders become um, better at avoiding detection, better at committing their crime. So if we take Jack the Ripper, for instance, which um, most people are familiar with, he um, murdered sexual workers in the Whitechapel district in 1888. His modus operandi was um, the weapon that he used in order to, to murder the women, so he used a knife. Uh, the fact that he targeted women late at night in this particular area, those are all modus operandi. Criminal signature apparently is the bit that tells us about that person's psyche. So these are the pieces of the crime that fit some kind of emotional or psychological need of that offender. Um, they're usually idiosyncratic features of the crime that don't actually contribute to the end result. So in the case of Jack the Ripper, um, things like uh, he engaged in what's called overkill, so he would um, exhibit violent, more violence than is needed to kill the women. There would be multiple stab wounds, that sort of thing. He would um, try and shame the victim by um, posing the bodies, that sort of thing. They don't actually fit the need of the murder, they fit the need of that offender. 
And this is the stuff that supposedly tells us about, about that person. Uh, the second thing that they did is make a distinction between organized offenders and disorganized offenders. So organized offenders, an example of which is Ted Bundy, tend to have high IQ, they're socially and sexually competent, they often have a partner and children, um, they plan their offences, they hide the body, all that sort of thing. And on the basis of this, it can give you clues about, um, that will help you narrow down who you're looking for, for instance, narrow down your, your suspects, but it can also tell you things that you can do in order to find them. So follows investigation means that if you have an offender like this, they'll do things like hold a community meeting for people in the area and then everyone who comes to that community meeting becomes a suspect because the idea is that these people come to those meetings in order to get something from the, the stir that's being caused because of them. Disorganised offenders. Um, this is Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, as an example of a disorganised offender. Low IQ, um, incompetent socially and sexually, uh, live alone, don't have a job, don't plan, it's often opportunistic. They engage, engage in um, interesting behaviours like necrophilia, bestiality, that sort of thing. Um, and these people, so when interrogating, you show them empathy, that you understand where they're coming from, all that kind of thing, um, and that you interview at night because these people tend to be night owls. That, that kind of idea. So one thing you might have been doing while I was going through this is trying to figure out whether George Metzke would be a disorganized or an organized offender. So on the basis of this, any, what, who of you think that George Metzke, our mad bomber, would be a disorganized offender? No? Some? Yeah? Organized? More people. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's because, you know, they planned their offenses. Um, they were neat, they're probably maybe high IQ. The problem with that is that, I mean, he wasn't particularly socially competent. He didn't have a partner, he lived with his sisters. And often mental illness is a feature of disorganized offenders. So that's a problem. It's actually very difficult to say that someone is a di disorganized offender or an organized offender. People are typically a mixture of both. And this speaks to the, the kind of um, eerie fairy nature of FBI profiling, really. It, it might sound similar to personality testing, to star sign stuff. Um, the profiles tend to be pretty ambiguous, and after the fact, they are then made to fit whoever is found for that profile. Um, there's a lack of empirical base because of the fact that they are so eerie fairy. It makes it very difficult to then assess whether they were um, accurate or not. Uh, it focuses on relatively extreme offenders, so sexual, serial, homicide in the first instance. Uh, it assumes that personality remains consistent, which we know it doesn't, it changes over the lifetime and it also changes from context to context. Uh, and then there were some notable misses. So um, Washington Snipers, their profile was a solo white middle-aged male from the military, which wasn't accurate. Uh, Richard Jewell, so he um, found a bomb in the 1996 Atlanta game and he uh, alerted the authorities and they uh, evacuated the stadium and saved a, a lot of lives on the basis of that. Unfortunately for him, he met whatever um, the FBI decided was a lone bomber profile. They never actually said what that was. So his name was plastered all over the news as a suspect. His house was searched multiple times. Um, and it didn't actually end up to be him. He wasn't the bomber. So just a couple of cautionary tales of what happens when we start using these profiles to try and uh, match people to particular crimes. There is a slightly more empirically based method of, of criminal profiling called statistical profiling. It's developed by this guy called David Cantor in the 1980s. And what they do is they take large data sets of people who have been found or caught for particular crimes, and then they statistically find associations between people and their crimes, but then also features of crimes as well, so that they can link chains of offences together and say, oh, it's probably committed by the same person. Um, so this has got slightly more empirical base to it. The problem, though, is obviously this is on people who have been caught. So whether they share features with people who have not been caught, uh, we're not too sure. <laughs> 
Uh, this is just an example of what some of that looks like. So the crime theme, the instrumental opportunistic, and these characteristics of the offender and the crime scene tend to be linked. So that's the kind of thing that you would get from an analysis like that. So the first question we want to ask is, it's all well and good that we're developing these profiles, but how valid and reliable are they? So on the first question of reliability, um, Fox and Farrington last year did a meta-analysis looking at 300 books, articles, um, reports that had been written developing methods of criminal profiling. And basically the point here, you can see all these different offence types down here. Here is the range of profiles that different um, methods of profiling come up with. So if you look at homicide, some profiling techniques will differentiate people into two profiles, some will differentiate them into six. So there doesn't seem to be much consistency in how people decide to profile different offence types. So reliability-wise, we're not great at this point. On the validity question, so the idea here is that profiling, even if it is accurate, which as I said before is quite hard to test, it's only useful if it's actually contributing to that investigation. It's all well and good if it's accurate once that person's found, like George Metzke, but we need profiling to, to be actively contributing to an investigation for it to be a useful task, right? So that was the focus of this study called Coles to Newcastle. That's because the idea was they were testing, does it provide new and useful information or are you just delivering Coles to Newcastle? Are you just telling the investigative team stuff they already know? So in this case, they, uh, this was a study conducted by the Metropolitan Police. They went to around 200 um, officers, police officers, police staff, who had been involved in uh, investigations where some kind of criminal profiling advice had been offered to them in the course of that investigation. Most were murder cases, some rape cases, some burglary cases. Of those people, around about 80% said that the um, profiling advice contributed useful information. Sounds pretty good, until you ask them why was that information useful. 60% said it furthered their understanding of the offender, but 50% said it was because it confirmed what they already knew. So it's useful because then they can say, like, look, I was right, and here's the, here's the research that shows that I was right. And then they asked them, how, how often did it actually assist in solving a case? 14% said that it assisted in solving a case. And only less than 3% said that it actually led to the identification of an offender. So whether it is providing useful information or not is still an open question. Um, there was one uh, recent study where they um, ran an experiment where in this case, it was a, a series of uh, police stations in Florida. And in one station, the treatment station, um, they taught them a method of criminal profiling for burglary, for solving burglaries. Uh, and then the three other controls, they just continued their practice as usual. Not randomised, they got the treatment people because they were the closest to the researchers, so it was cheaper to train the officers. Uh, and of course it's uh, who agrees to um, participate in the study as well. Uh, this, by the way, was the criminal profiling technique they used, so there were four different profiles. Um, and based on the offence description, it told them things about the offender. So that's the profiling uh, technique they used. This is the result they got. So you can see pre-test burglary arrest rates um, were actually worse in that one treatment station. Uh, they then followed them up uh, six months post um, the training and arrest rates had risen quite significantly. So that was about a 260% relative increase in arrest rate for the treatment group. So maybe an indication that it was helpful in that case, obviously it's one study, it's a very small study, um, but just highlighting that there is the potential it could be useful, but it's something we absolutely need to do more research on. So I guess in summary on um, criminal profiling, it's not really as magical as people like to assume it is. It sounds really cool once someone's been arrested and the profile matches, 
but it's n perhaps not that useful in actual investigations. And in New Zealand, we don't use criminal profiling in investigations. We do have a criminal profiling unit that, as I said before, what they do is try and link crimes together so they know they're looking for the same person for a particular series of crimes, um, but that's about the extent of what we do in New Zealand. Okay, risk assessment. So, uh, criminal profiling is looking at trying to identify people um, after they've committed the crime. Risk assessment is kind of the opposite. We want to know how likely is it that this person sitting in front of the parole board or sitting in, in front of the judge in court is going to reoffend. Do we need to put them under extended supervision order, for instance? Do we need to be targeting intense treatment towards this person? Just on that, um, we know from research that if you provide too intense a treatment to a low-risk offender, it actually increases their risk of reoffending. So that's why we need to be careful about how much treatment we're giving uh, to people depending on their risk. So this is a tricky question. Who is the highest risk when you've got these different people sitting in front of you? Someone who's got mental illness, someone who's a gang member, someone who's committed sex offences? I mean, let's go around. So who's the highest risk, do you think? Raise your hand. Uh, someone with mental illness. Okay. Uh, young offender. Okay. Someone who's committed uh, high frequency of crime in the, in the past. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lacking empathy. Okay. Uh, committed sex offences. Yep. And a gang member. Right, okay, so it's obviously a nuanced answer, but just on the very broad level, highest risk would be a toss-up probably between gang and youth. Um, the younger people are, the higher the offending rate. Not necessarily gangs, I guess. It's more the biggest predictor of future offending is having antisocial associates. So it's hanging around people who support your criminal behaviour, basically. Lacking empathy, no relationship with future offending. Um, so having no empathy for your victim is not predictive of whether someone's going to reoffend or not. The idea there is that... Um, uh, no, I'll, I'll talk about it later. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, sex offences are relatively low risk. So, um, sex offences, around about 20% of, of sexual offenders will reoffend without treatment. So, it's actually quite a low base rate. Um, the other big one actually is high frequency. So, the best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour. Extensive criminal history is also a, a very good predictor of um, future behaviour. Particularly the age at which people started. If they started young, that's typically an indicator that it's going to continue. But it's obviously a lot more nuanced than that. Like, you know, what if they're young and a sexual offender, but they don't hang around a gang? There's all these different facets that contribute to whether someone is going to um, commit crime or not. There's also a couple of questions we need to consider when we're asking about their risk. So the first of all is risk of what? And people are going to say, what's their risk of reoffending? But how do we measure that? I mean, we could look at arrest rates, but we know that some of the people who were arrested didn't actually do anything. We could look at conviction rates, but then we know a lot of people, particularly if they don't have a criminal history, will be discharged without conviction, or they can plea bargain their way down. We could look at imprisonment, but then again, we know we're only going to be capturing the serious offending, and we also know there's a racial bias within the system, um, where people who are Māori or Pacific are more likely to be imprisoned for the same crime. So it's actually really tricky trying to figure out an appropriate outcome variable to test our risk assessment tools. We also might be more in interested in things more than just dichotomous did they or didn't they. We might want to know things like, okay, they came into prison for a quite violent offence on, on, on their partner, for instance. If they then reoffend with a theft, we could consider that a success in some ways if you're looking to reduce harm, for instance. So looking at the severity or the type of crime might be something that we're interested in as well, not just did they reoffend or didn't they.
Um, we also might, to, might like to look at how frequently did they reoffend, because it's quite interesting when you when you look at addiction, for instance, we know that people relapse. We don't expect people to go cold turkey straight away. We know that it's a process of change. But when it suddenly becomes crime, we expect people to stop overnight, and it's just not realistic. It's the same sort of process of behaviour change that needs to happen. And so maybe we need a more nuanced view of what we should be expecting to see when we are succeeding with our treatment, for instance. And then finally, what can we actually do with this knowledge of risk? So we don't want to come into a situation like Minority Report where we're arresting people on the basis of something that they might do in future. So what we do do with um, knowledge of risk at the moment, again, as I said, we can direct resources, high intensity treatment to those people who are highest risk. Um, we also use it, as I said before, extended supervision orders and public protection orders. So those are where people can be kept in prison or under community supervision beyond their sentence. Definitely some ethical questions around that and whether we should be doing that and whether our tools are good enough to do that, but that's what we do use them for at the moment. Um, so how do we assess risk? So basically there's two different kinds of risk factors that contribute to someone's risk. Um, static risk, dynamic risk, and it kind of you might be able to work it out. Static risk is risk factors that they can't change. It's how many crimes have you committed in the past, how old were you when you started, um, your gender, all that sort of thing contributes to your risk and it's not something that you can just change. Dynamic risk, on the other hand, is something that psychologists can particularly target in treatment to try and um, reduce someone's risk. Or conversely, that person can be working on it themselves. So it's factors that can change. Um, as I mentioned before, it's things like hanging around with the wrong people, so antisocial associates. It can be having um, attitudes that are supportive of crime. So for instance, I was wronged in the past and therefore I deserve this thing that I'm stealing or this person that I'm punching or you know that sort of stuff. Um, and another really common one is impulsivity and poor emotional regulation, that sort of thing. People who just flare up, uh, another big dynamic risk factor. So in terms of static risk, what do we know? So let's go through these. Who's riskier, males or females? So males? Females, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, offender age we've already kind of covered. Uh, offence type, so who's riskiest? Um, any ideas, any ideas? What's the most common offence type that people will re-offend with? Is it, like, let's, let's break this up. Will people re-offend with the same kind of crime they went into prison for initially, or will it be something different? So let's say, uh, criminal specialisation, so they repeat the same crime. Okay, and criminal generalisation. Okay. Uh, ethnicity, does ethnicity contribute to risk? Does it not? Okay, let's, contributes to risk? Does not contribute to risk. Okay. Current sentence, so people who are on shorter or longer sentences, who thinks shorter sentence is riskier? Longer sentence? Okay. And that kind of speaks to this too, seriousness. So people who commit a more serious offence versus a less. So more serious? Okay, and less serious. Okay, cool. Kind of even splits throughout, apart from the obvious ones. And I do have to apologise for these graphs. I lifted them from a corrections report and they used 3D bar charts and I'm very sorry. Um, okay, yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, so the green bar is re-imprisonment, um, blue bar is re-conviction. So as you can see here, males are re-imprisoned and re-convicted at a higher rate. It's interesting though to see that there's not a huge difference. So this is re-offending, remember, it's not first time offending or overall offending. So once people offend, gender doesn't have a huge impact, it's still definitely a difference though. Age, um, as I mentioned, uh, much higher risk when people are younger and it decreases over time. Typically it's thought to be, you know, as people become um, attached to certain things that make the criminal lifestyle have more of an impact. They get a job, they get a family, they have children. Continuing that criminal lifestyle is going to have a larger impact on them. Uh, types of crime. So highest for property, lowest for sexual offenders. And I'll show you a really interesting but kind of 
like, it's, it looks big, but what we've got here is people who have been imprisoned for different types of crime. And then across here is what they were re-imprisoned with. So if we look at this one here, for instance, it tells us that 20% of people imprisoned for a sexual offence are re-imprisoned for another sexual offence. What's interesting here is that pretty much across the board, people are re-imprisoned most often for a theft. People don't tend to specialise. They tend to be re-imprisoned for another theft. Uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, exceptions. Sexual offending, to some extent, does specialise. Um, Violent offending to some extent as well, but you can see theft is still very common for those, uh, those people there. And then drug offending, oh, sorry, that's theft there. Drug offending here. Yeah. So drug offending tends to specialise a little bit as well. But in general, people are generalists. They will commit all types of different crime. Uh, and reimprisonment by ethnicity, so uh, Pacifica tend to be uh, lower re-imprisonment, re-conviction rates. Uh, European or Pakia and Māori tend to be higher. But again, you'll notice that the, the um, difference between the two isn't that big in comparison to overall rates of people in the um, offending population in prison, for instance. And it's important to note here as well that if you properly control for all other risk factors, ethnicity no longer is a predictor. So if you properly control for poverty, for um, lower rates of education, lower employment, employment, that sort of thing, then ethnicity is no longer a predictor. Sentence length. So shorter sentences tend to have higher rates of re-imprisonment. Um, partially that's because the longer that you're in prison, the older you get, and so the age factor kicks in. And it's also because this lower level crime is often the theft and the drug offences, which are the highest um, highest rates of reoffending. Seriousness, kind of, kind of level, not a huge difference. Um, until you get to very high and then reoffending drops off significantly. Um, kind of makes sense, they'll be in prison for quite a long time. Um, also, these tend to be homicides, which people don't tend to reoffend with another homicide. Dynamic risk. So those are the static risk factors. Here's dynamic risk. So as I mentioned before, um, so sorry, central eight. So these are the eight factors that have the strongest empirical link with reoffending over multiple meta-analyses across multiple countries as well. So pro-criminal associates. We've already kind of talked about that. Family marital things. So dysfunctional family um, things like attachment would go into there, for instance. Um, Pro-criminal attitudes, we've mentioned that, that's the, the beliefs or attitudes that are supportive of your crime. You don't believe that what you've done is that bad a thing. School or work, so it's basically having um, good education, having employment. Substance abuse, self-explanatory. Leisure recreation, it's basically not having the time to do bad stuff. So when, you're, when you, you've got good hobbies, which often connect you in with... Um, uh, with uh, pro-social associates. Um, yeah, you just tend to have less time on your hands to get up to trouble. Antisocial personality pattern, I'll talk a little bit about that. That's the psychopathy kind of style of, of people. And then, as I said before, criminal history. This is an interesting one, because criminal history is actually a static risk factor, but it's always, it's always tied up in these central eight dynamic risk factors. It's just such an important factor that it can't really be ignored. Things that are not predictive of reoffending: minimizing denial and, as I said before, lack of victim empathy. So people who minimize or deny their offense, it doesn't come across well, obviously, but it actually has no relationship with whether they're going to go on to reoffend or not. The idea there is that if they're minimizing, if they're denying, they at least at some level know what is and isn't appropriate socially, and they're wanting to fit into that. So they're, so they're trying to be a better person. They want to be a good member of society. That's the current theory anyway. So in some ways, it can actually be protective if they're trying to do that. And, and, and interestingly, um, minimization, again, in addiction studies, we know that people who minimize their addiction say it's not me as a person. It's all these different factors that contribute to my addiction. 
that again um, is linked to lower rates of relapse in, in people who have addictions. So it's a similar sort of thing. It's people who don't believe that who they are as offenders are more likely to change. So how do we kind of tie that all up together? We use things called risk assessment tools. So this is a static risk assessment tool. And you'll see here, this is for sexual offending in particular. You see here that there's a list of static risk factors or dynamic and a dynamic version, which have been statistically linked with reoffending. And then people are given a score for different things. Uh, so here, age, you get a higher score for the younger you are, and you actually get a negative score the older you are. Here, um, any male victim, so having a male victim for a sexual offender actually makes them higher risk. So in that case, you get a higher risk score if you had male offenders, that sort of thing. And so we add up all those scores, and then based on that score, we're able to say, people who scored similarly to you re-offended at this kind of rate. So that's how we're able to break up um, uh, their risk. How well does it actually work? Not too bad. So um, risk assessment tools can predict um, risk about the same rate that screening mammography can, can identify cancer. So the accuracy rate is about 0.7, if you guys know AUCs, maybe not. So it's basically a 70% chance that a randomly selected re-offender will have a higher score than a randomly selected non-offender. So it's not too bad. It's okay at the aggregate level when we're trying to direct resources. It becomes trickier when we're trying to say this particular person has this risk of re-offending. Um, like most things, stuff that works at the aggregate doesn't necessarily work at the individual level. So to take an example, the very highest risk category that you can be in for sexual offending based on our best risk assessment tool, you have about a 50 or 60% chance of re-offending. So that's about half and half whether you're going to re-offend or not. And it's on that basis that we decide that you should be locked up at the end of your sentence and not released. So that's what, it, that's what I mean when we talk about the ethics of using that kind of level of accuracy to decide who should be locked up. Um, just on that, tools much better than clinical judgment. Clin clinicians typ typically do no better than chance if they're asked to decide who will be a re-offender and who won't be without any kind of um, structured assessment. Um, part of that is that people, first of all, um, will consider things that have no relationship with offending, like empathy, like minimization. People tend to forget that these things share some of the variance, so the predictive power that comes from one factor is kind of shared by multiple, so they're not just additive in terms of risk. Um, and the other thing is what we call scientifically the ick factor, so they just kind of make you feel icky, and so you, d you bump up their risk a little bit. Finally, psychopathy. Um, so psychopathy is another area that um, really interests people, and people have this idea that um, you know, there are psychopaths all, among, all amongst us, and they ha um, are always committing offences, and they're incredibly dangerous, and all that kind of thing. And I guess um, what I want to tell you today is perhaps to give a bit more nuance to that. So just incidentally, psychopathy isn't actually a clinical diagnosis that's in the DSM. Um, typically, people will instead get the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. That's because uh, what we, when we think of psychopaths, we usually think of things like they lack empathy, they have superficial charm, um, they have shallow emotions. These are all things that can't be measured behaviorally. And so in that case, they're not part of the DSM, which decided its diagnosis should be based on behavior and not things that you can't measure like empathy or cognitions. Um, so what that means is that around 60 to 80 percent of offenders will have antisocial personality disorder or can be diagnosed with that. Only around 20 or 40 percent can be diagnosed with psychopathy. So it's a subset, really. And then additionally, a sociopath is just kind of a pop science term. It's not something that's used in the academic literature. So how do we identify psychopaths? Um, usually we use something called the Psychopathy Checklist Revised. It was developed by a Canadian guy called um, Here. It's separated into a couple of fa factors. So the first factor is, are these things here. This is what we think of when we think of psychopaths. Um, 
superficial charm, they lie all the time, they're manipulative, they have a lack of empathy, the kind of personality characteristics. Then you have factor two. So um, poor behavioral controls, they're impulsive, they have a history of um, committing all sorts of different crimes, um, they have a need for stimulation, that sort of thing, the behavioral side of stuff, antisocial behavior side of stuff. And then you've got two things that don't load onto either factor, so they kind of sit out by themselves. Um, promiscuous sexual behavior and many short-term marital relationships. So these are the factors that are used, um, similar to that scoring sheet I showed you before, um, it's measured in a similar sort of way. One of the problems with this is that when we um, use this checklist on offenders and then assess their reoffending, overall, we find that this predicts reoffending pretty well. It's not too bad. But when you dive down deeper, a lot of that predictive power is coming from this factor here, not the first one. And something that might strike you with the second one is it looks a hell of a lot just like risk assessment, right? So what's happening is that this part, which is what we really think of when we think of psychopath, it's the bit that's doing all the work when we think about what it means to be a psychopath, isn't actually predicting crime. It's all this just normal risk assessment stuff that they're kind of tacked on to that diagnosis or that definition. So in that way, Asking about whether psychopathy is predictive of reoffending is it's not exactly clear. In terms of what we'd think of as a traditional psychopath, not that predictive. Um, there's plenty of people out in society who I'm sure you can think of one person sitting in a very important office at the moment who gets by incredibly well, maybe with a little bit of offending, but you know. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that because you have these things, you're going to offend. You just might be a bit of a dick, you know. <laughs> One of the other problems, um, and this goes to uh, what that gentleman mentioned before about Rosenhan. Um, so say you've been diagnosed with psychopathy. So it carries a massive label with it. Uh, so you're told that you're a, uh, you could be diagnosed on the basis of these factors here with a couple of things in there. That go what goes with that is that all of this gets attributed to that person. So that person um, doesn't have any empathy, they can't accept responsibility, but maybe it wasn't actually those particular factors that led you to that diagnosis in the first place. But if you try and say to people, no, look, I really am, I feel so bad about what I've done, what are they going to think? They're going to think that you're manipulating them, they're going to think that you're just trying to weasel your way out of the diagnosis, all that sort of thing. The Rosenhan study, by the way, um, I, people here familiar with that? So back in the 70s, apparently, um, what happened was Rosenhan and some of his colleagues, uh, they decided to feign auditory hallucinations in order to get admitted into a psychiatric hospital. As soon as they were admitted into the psychiatric hospital, they no longer pretended to have those symptoms, they just acted as they normally would. Um, on average, it took them 19 days to get released, and some were in there for months, because people refused to acknowledge that maybe they didn't have that condition after all. They'd been given their label of schizophrenia, so that's what they had. And any normal behaviours were considered to be abnormal, so they would go to their rooms because they didn't want to really mix that much. That was seen as isolating themselves and, you know, trying to say, I'm here, I'm a scientist just testing out the hospital. Like, oh yeah, okay mate, sure you are. So that's for the Rosenhan study. There's a bit more to it, but yeah, that's the basic. The second thing is that when you're labeled a psychopath, people automatically think you're unhelpable, you're untreatable. That comes from this study back in the 90s. So um, Harris, Rice and Cormier did a study where they evaluated a treatment program um, for violent men in Canada. And afterwards, they looked at what was the proportion of those people who went on to reoffend. So you can see for psychopaths, so we've got treated people are these black bars and people who didn't go through the treatment are these white bars. So non-psychopaths, people who were treated re-offended at a lower rate, success. People, psychopaths who were treated actually re-offended at a higher rate than, people, than psychopaths who were not. So this led to this massive idea that psychopaths, not only can't they, be, can they not be treated, 
they get worse. They learn how to commit their crimes better. They learn how to manipulate people. They learn how to avoid. Has anyone heard this before, that psychopaths actually get worse? You're treating them? Yeah. So that's where this comes from. If you dig into the study, you might want to ask, well, what was the treatment that they were actually given um, in this prison? Uh, first of all, uh, the patients acted as their own therapists. So they ran therapy sessions amongst themselves. A confrontation between the patients was encouraged as part of the therapy. Um, they were given LSD and um, stimulants as part of this treatment. Uh, patients who were suicidal or self-harmed were handcuffed to another patient who then became responsible for that person not harming themselves. Um, and then the best, the best treatment of all, um, nude encounter therapy, where they were put in a small bare room that was kept lit 24 hours of the day so they didn't know what time it was. Um, they were not allowed clothes. They were fed through tubes in the wall. Um, and they were kept in there for several weeks at a time. So, not surprising maybe that this treatment didn't work, right? But this led to this myth that psychopaths can't be treated. So just highlighting that when we're assessing whether particular people can or can't be treated, we really need to be fo focusing in on, well, what were the mechanisms through which you thought these people could be treated? Um, it can cause a lot of harm when you're trying out treatments that don't, it shouldn't really work anyway, right? Uh, leads me to the final thing, what does work? So, um, there are some programs that are showing some effect with psychopaths, they're intense uh, treatments. Uh, it's a small evidence base, no RCTs. It's very difficult to get an RCT through an ethics board in corrections, because the idea is if you think it's going to work, then you, you've got an obligation to try it. Um, that's the attitude. Um, but treatments that do work tend to focus on the behaviour rather than the personality. So it just looks like a normal treatment that we would give to any offending group. Uh, it focuses on um, interactions with other people. It focuses on regulating your emotions. Um, that's really it. There's nothing really magical. It's just that they need a lot of it because often, um, as we saw before, the risk factors that contributed, lots of different crimes, long history of crimes, so therefore we would need an intensive treatment for these people. So nothing too magical, it's about focusing on the behavior, not on the personality. Again, they can be dicks as long as they're not offending, right? Uh, and then that's it. Why are you down the back? Thanks for that. So, given the wake of the fourth industrial revolution, potentially the rise in artificial intelligence oh, and yeah. data gathering through the internet of things and possibilities in analytics and big data, yeah. should they be applied to criminal prevention and criminal response? So, um, the question probably it is happening already, so um, they are doing it. I guess the question is, should they continue to do that? Um, part of the problem is that you've got to consider when you're using administrative data like that in algorithms, is consider what are the biases inherent in that data, because that's just going to be perpetuated in some kind of algorithm. So if we consider things like the racial bias that's in the in the current system think about if you're using social media who are the kinds of people who are using social media and do they represent the general population uh, it becomes perhaps questionable about how accurate those algorithms are going to be in saying that i think they are using them for instance in the uk to decide on police hotspotting so where should they be targeting more intense um policing and that sort of thing, but again, it becomes a problem if, if there's lots of people from a particular community who have been arrested before, it's just going to continue that cycle because they suddenly become the people who become over-policed and all that sort of thing. Um, so it is happening, I just think we need to really be aware of what the possible issues with that might be. Yep. Thank you. Um, Probably in this area uh, okay. more than many, <laughs> <Fingers crossed>. many <laughs> yeah. most. Yeah. Uh, um, 
you're going to have a lot of missing data, I guess, when yeah. people reoffend. Some people won't be caught, yeah. so there might be a lot of reoffences. Yeah. Um, what impact does that have on the predictive models? And also, I guess, um, uh, oh, no, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good question. And it's one of those cases where we don't know what we don't know. Um, sometimes studies will use self-reported offending rather than uh, offending that has been detected. People are, like, disturbingly honest, I suppose, and people will report crimes that haven't been detected. Typically, they find that the risk assessment tools are as accurate as um, for non-detected crimes. Um, but obviously, we're just talking about very different volumes of offending, I suppose. But from what we know, they are accurate. But again, it's one of those situations it's very hard to research. But yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, so I guess the question becomes, is there anything about the data that's missing that would change the predictability? So is there something different about offenders who manage to get by with undetected? If there's not really a difference between those two groups, it wouldn't really matter. Uh, some of the question comes in in things like female offending or offending in very specific subgroups. We don't have a lot of information on those kinds of offenders, so developing tools specific to populations can be an issue too. People tend to think it generalises, but yeah. Yeah. Very well presented, Jacinta. Oh, yeah. Do you have any hypotheses on why our incarceration rate in New Zealand is so high? Because um, it works well with the public. It, 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 it sounds really good. Tough on crime sounds good. It sounds like what we want. So it's just a series of political decisions that have led to that. Um, one of the recent ones, for instance, was um, because of a couple of high-profile crimes that happened while people were on parole and on bail. Uh, parole boards and judges became a lot more reluctant to grant parole, to grant bail, and that made our prison population just burst. So it can be little decisions like that that can have a huge impact on our prison population. Um, and just, just um, to note, the longer that someone's on parole, the less likely that they are to reoffend. We want people on parole, we want them to be helped into reintegration. So releasing people early is actually a good thing a lot of the time because that means they can go on parole for longer. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, what's the latest thinking on genetic markers for crime? In other words, the crime gene that popped up a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So it's just starting to be tested in the courts at the moment. So this is the idea that there's a genetic thing that um, makes you more violent, for instance, more likely to commit crime. It's being tested in court at the moment. The idea is that, sure, like we know that genetics have a huge impact on things like temperament, on impulsivity, that sort of thing. The question becomes, what do you do with that information? Because if you're saying that these people have no control over their own behavior because of their genetics, they might be less culpable for their crime, but it kind of gives more justification for them being locked away because they can't help it. So that's often what you find. When you ask juries, uh, jurors about this, they'll say, yes, I found them less responsible, but they should be more harshly sentenced because they're not safe in society. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, yeah. But genetics, they, they think about 40% of antisocial behavior is um, the contribution of genetics. Yeah. Do you have any... Do you have any comment on um, Simon Bridges' proposal to <laughs> yeah. take the game? Or I can ask you at um, lunchtime if you'd rather <laughs> no, not make it fine. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's not a great idea. So, yes, antisocial associates is one of the contributors to crime, but in that case, policing the gangs more heavily isn't looking at the factors of why people join gangs in the first place. They're looking for connection, they're looking for status, they might be looking for power. There's a whole lot of different reasons why people join gangs and just policing them more heavily is not going to do anything to stop them. Uh, hi. Um, at the uh, University of Canterbury, they have the brain fingerprinting yeah. uh, research which is going on. Do you have anything to say about that? It's cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so this brain fingerprinting stuff, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that. It's um, the idea that uh, when people see a particular piece of information that they've seen before, there are particular brain waves that you can pick up on. So the idea is that if you show them a picture of a victim or something that other people in the general public would not have seen before, you'll be able to detect the fact that they have seen that through particular brain patterns. 
Um, so it's called fingerprinting because it would be the new fingerprinting technique. It's identifying particular people and whether they have a relationship with the crime. Really cool, but I, so far I'm not sure how well things have been replicated. I think these are two groups that are kind of vying and they've got different methods of doing it. Cool idea though, yeah. Okay, last question. I think there was a question at the back. Is there? No, okay. Yeah. Snooze, you lose. <laughs> Hi, thank you. I'm curious if you um, uh, have any opinion or if there's any, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> point. Um, the success of home detention versus um, prison? Oh yeah, so um, typically community sentences and tr treatment delivered in the community is uh, more effective than treatment delivered in prisons. Um, just because of the nature of prisons means that it's very difficult for people to practice the skills that they're learning, right? So therapy is all about practicing new skills, making it part of your habit, part of your routine. If you're in prison and you're trying to learn to talk about your feelings with other people, it's not gonna go down that well, right? So, and it incentivizes people being big and tough and being, yeah. So um, the environment in prison means that it's just not that conducive to helping people change. It also bunches people together so they become mates with other antisocial people. Um, Treatment in the community is much better effectiveness. In saying that there are some people who aren't safe in the community, so we still will need prisons for those kinds of people. Yeah. Super, okay, um, so that ends our uh, morning session. Um, I'd like you to join me in thanking uh, both Jacinta and all of our speakers for this morning.